Thank you all for being here. Uh, it is a great pleasure and an honor actually to have with us Professor Girti today. Uh, I don't think he needs any introductions. Uh, you all know him. He's one of the most uh, respected authorities in human rights law. Uh, Cambridge, LSE, plenty of books, uh, monographs, uh, articles, a blog that uh, we are all aware of. Uh, uh, a founder of the Matrix Chamber, which means that our students, uh, you're free to give him your CV before you go. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm sure that if you ask him what has been the biggest uh, honor in his career, very rich career until now, he'll tell you that is the email he received uh, a few months ago from uh, Kastensen and myself when we invited him to join the editorial board of a, a new law journal on the European Convention of Human Rights will be launching soon. Uh, he accepted, we are very uh, happy for this and uh, thankful. Uh, so, is this the biggest moment in your career? The biggest moment was being invited by Constantine to give this talk. This, uh, this talk, okay. And he's not even here. <laughs> he's, not even, <laughs> not even here. he's not even here. So, uh, with no further ado, uh, the Human Rights Act, uh, the past uh, and the future. Thank you, Thank very, you very much. much it's very nice to see you again. We had a conference together in uh, Florence. Florence, and we had that, you had that great book which is just out, so, on consensus in the European Court of Human Rights. So I'm delighted to be here, but you're going to, do you mind if I wander around a bit? Yeah. But uh, I have to be away at about 20 past four. So for those of you who thought this was ending at four, sorry. For those of you who thought it was going on till five, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I know exactly how it feels. You think you want to go to a lecture, you're committed to the lecture, you're looking forward to the lecture, and you're in two minutes in and you think, why the hell did I go to this lecture? That must have been so much. And now, because you can pretend to be tweeting, you can look at your phone and do emails, but we don't have a hashtag. So you have no, especially all you people millions of miles away, you have no excuse, you have to listen to me. All right? And the incentive is that you have to frame a question which will... Uh, kind of achieve a social impact on your immediate circle. So a good question. So that's your little task. I'm going to speak for, what did we say, about 30 minutes or so? Uh, so somebody can vaguely keep an eye on it, but it's fairly short talk. And what it's about is this. I've got a PowerPoint. And I want to have a kind of discussion about the Human Rights Act <coughs> and where it is. And I've got a little theme of of, I'm, I'm kind of humanizing the Human Rights Act, so I'm thinking of it as, as a child that's reached the age of 21. And I've got a PowerPoint, so there we go. Uh, I'm doing a talk which is not so much about all the kind of front page stuff. So this isn't necessarily about, though maybe it will be in the question and answer session, about whether the Human Rights Act is going to be repealed, uh, whether or not it's going to survive, I have views on that, survive the, uh, uh, the Brexit suicide. Uh, we could talk about that maybe if we need to. And also, it's not on Fantasy Island. I did a book on the human rights thing, which is uh, going through the cases and so on. And uh, I'm, I'm delighted with that book, actually. But it's, it's a noisy book. It's quite an engaged book. So in the, with a small p, it's a political book. But here, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about the academic side of things. I'll try and liven it up, but a bit more about the academic side of things. Because, now that it's 21, uh, it's generated quite a lot of its own stuff. And the stuff that's generated isn't all about the substance of the rights. There's been a case this morning, for example, on the bedroom tax, which I haven't read yet. But it's, it's, these cases are amazing about the substance. But I'm not that. I'm looking more at the at the case law around the mechanics of the Human Rights Act. Uh, I think I'm making some points about those mechanics in my 30 minutes or so. A uh, personal aspect to all of this. Uh, Adam, is it risky to double click on this? No. Will I lose everything? Will that's a little risky. Yeah. <laughs> Adam's really confident about how computers work. Uh, this is, this is my, oh my god, I have to join something. Am I okay with that? Yeah. Don't worry about the travel lodge. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time, this thing is 21, it's 
this same all makes you feel old. I'm so old, I spent about 10 years opposing it before it happened. And so I was very anti the Human Rights Act. And I, I had to do this article for The Guardian. They were running a series on things you've changed your mind about. And I decided to write mine about, and this is it, I changed my mind about whether I changed my mind. Didn't really follow that. And what I said for years was, my approach to human rights had not altered. My opposition to human rights in the 90s was based on a certain assumption about the kind of act of parliament we would get, which would be essentially a Canadian or American style with courts striking stuff down. We didn't get that. We got a much subtler law. And I'm cool about the subtler law because it meets the concerns I had, and so I haven't changed my mind. I've stopped saying, I think I have changed my mind. I'm very pleased we have a human rights law. And I don't think any of us could have anticipated the kind of culture we'd be in now. And I certainly hadn't. I made certain assumptions about social democratic progress. Uh, and, 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 and so without those assumptions having been realized, I'm, I'm pretty keen on human rights. And I have changed my mind. But obviously, I approach it as a former skeptic, in other words. Now, the uh, analogy again of humanizing the Human Rights Act. Uh, I'm going to start by talking about, it's 21, what are its parents, who are its parents? And if you want a little snapshot coming up about the Human Rights Act, here it is. It's got, it's very old-fashioned Human Rights Act, it's got two parents. It's a marriage between the common law and European uh, law that has given birth the Human Rights Act. And the common law is the one I'm going to mention at the start, and it divides up what has been the impact of the Human Rights Act on the common law. And by the common law, I'm going to work through three different subsets of the common law. And the first is the criminal law, the second is public law, and the third is the common law proper, common law stuff. Now, preliminary remark. When the Human Rights Act was being argued for in the mid-90s, when everyone was trying to get the ear of the Labour opposition knowing there would be government, the main argument was the law is broken, we need to fix it. So the emphasis was on radical change. That has to be the emphasis or you'll never persuade anybody that your law is worth having. So there's quite a head of steam about the radical potential of a human rights law. But the minute it's being properly proposed in the period between autumn 1997 and 2000, because it was introduced as a bill in the autumn of 1997, it was enacted in November 1998, and it was brought into force fully on the 2nd of October two th uh, 2000. Yeah. Uh, the emphasis changed. And we were all, we all had to educate the judges. You knew, it was an amazing time. All these lefties were invited in to lecture the judges, all of them, on human rights, because none of them knew any about it. Uh, I, gave a speech to a bunch of men who resembled my dad in the Chief Justice's court, because as a human rights lawyer in King's, Robin Old, who was a Lord Justice, invited me to speak to all the High Court and Court of Appeal judges and House of Lords judges. And so, you know, someone like me would never have access to that community normally, and there were lots of people like me. A lot of the people who went into matrix chambers with me were, were doing this education. But the emphasis then from the people behind the act was we're not working against the common law, we're working through the common law. So the emphasis shifted. Dramatic revolutionary promise to get the bill, conservative implementation when you've got the bill. It's not surprising. It's not surprising. Uh, 
big picture point on the criminal, all of this can be summed up in a sentence. Although some of you guys are criminal lawyers and know more about the recent stuff than maybe me. The common law has co-opted human rights law in battle to assert judicial control over stuff that Parliament has taken from them, in a nutshell. What's the stuff that Parliament has taken from them? Procedural safeguards, sentencing, burdens of proof, criminal stuff. And so there's a pattern, in my opinion. And the pattern is of the deployment of the capacity inherent in the Human Rights Act to rewrite, not change, legislation to ensure a restoration of assumptions about judicial control over important bits of the criminal law. And it's good to have a PowerPoint because uh, I don't have to go through it all uh, here, but you've got Lambert, one of the very early, these are very early, you see, burden of proof stuff. Uh, often, amazing case, uh, throw away the key, and, and Lord Wolfe, who was the Chief Justice, I think, at the time, found cases and re-litigated these cases, and poor Olofen was a deeply inadequate individual, posing no threat to anybody who had found himself in jail for life, and deploy an exceptionality clause in the relevant sentencing law to be able to say, no, you can't do that. You can't routinely send people to jail forever. Old school judicial authority rules. RNA, the most controversial case for years under the Human Rights Act. RVA is blokes normally have to have burden of proof beyond reasonable doubt in cases of rape. What can you say about the woman's previous sexual history? Well, you can say a bit. A bit goes a long way in front of a jury. The Parliament managed to stop that as a result of a big push to try and restrict previous complainants' sexual history, and the court undoes it in R versus A. Undoes it. Say, I'm sorry, that's unfair on the accused. Very controversial. They uh, very uh, rewrote, in the name of justice, the summing up to the jury, and I, I think that was a terrible decision, but it was an example of what I'm describing. It was going with the grain of old school common law. And so those are coming up proper. These cases, this big, big paragraph, is about how Parliament wanted to introduce all these extra criminal kind of nasty things. So we might throw you into internment without trial, or we might ban your organization, or we might serve you with some kind of antisocial order, or we might do uh, a control order on you, and so a lot of cases in the first 10 to 12 years of the Human Rights Act was litigating these quasi-criminal restrictions on liberty in the name of human rights, forcing procedural safeguards that would not normally, in the absence of human rights, have been available. So uh, the most famous case is the Belmarsh case, but subsequent to that, a whole bunch of cases on control orders. What happened was the Belmarsh case was the internment case, and then they, the government did change the law, Parliament, and then you have all these cases in the, as it was, House of Lords, and even ending it in the Supreme Court, saying, oh, you can't be that mean to him, he's got a family, or, oh, you've told him nothing about why you're imposing these control orders, you need to tell him something, and the same to be found uh, in, in, in these cases to do with, uh, actually to do with uh, registers. So people who are on uh, abuse registers, can they ever get off? Uh, people who find themselves unable to get work, uh, what can they be told? And, and so it's, it's a reaction to what nowadays could be, I suppose, too quickly described as populism. So Parliament engages in aggressive legislation, and the courts, under the cover of Section 3 interpretation, they impose safeguards. And then you've got these ones here uh, on, on, on prescription, banned organizations. 
And the banned organizations one in the Terrorism Act 2000 shows how the Human Rights Act had an effect on legislation independently of adjudication. So it's a tiny little parenthetic point, but it's worth making. These cases are evidence, as it were, of Parliament being caught up. But Parliament forewarned isn't caught up, but the Human Rights Act has done its work already. The example is 1998, Terrorism Bill, published the same time as the Human Rights Bill, Home Secretary can ban whoever he wants. He can't ban whoever he wants, because the Human Rights Act is about to come into force, and there's case law in the European Court of Human Rights, clear as a bell, which says, basically, on, on cases from Turkey, you can't just ban people you don't like. You have to have some independent judicial process. So the Terrorism Act 2000, as enacted, has a new organization called the Proscribed Organizations Appeals Commission, which you can appeal to if you're banned. And there are secret proceedings, but you have to be told uh, the thrust of the arguments, and there's a special advocate who represents you, which you can't get to talk to him, etc., etc. The point is that, however, the Terrorism Act 2000 anticipated human rights challenge. So we got two ways in which procedures are re-established along the common law's lines. One is adjudication, and the second is anticipation by the legislature. So cumulatively, quite a big deal. Quite a big deal. The game, take some of the register cases, sex abuse registers, involves government pretending they have to implement some of these decisions, blaming the court for them, but implementing them nevertheless. So the courts can either interpret under Section 3 or issue a declaration of incompatibility under Section 4, and governments here generally change the law, even if they don't like doing it. So that's been a big uh, restoration of common law authority, paradoxically. Uh, the second of the common law appearance, the public law. Again, we take things for granted if we know our Human Rights Act students, but generally, it, it's all part of the mainstream of judicial review. That is a big decision that was taken in 1997. There's no special procedures. There's no sort of consul d'etat at the top of a process. There's no referral to a special court, the Human Rights Court. It's bog standard every court. Now, I think that was a brilliant move. It integrated human rights in the normal legal process including judicial review. If you do judicial review cases, there's a little box on the form. Tick if you've got a human rights point. And so you tick the box. This has raised the question of where it fits. And again, it's been domesticated within the realm of traditional judicial review. <coughs> so public authorities, not defined in the Act, cases, 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 I'm not bothering with, telling you what they are, have to obey human rights. So it's become a kind of head of illegality, if you want to use GCHQ terminology. It's sort of, if a public authority ignores human rights, they're making an error of law. It's a breach. Uh, and in my doom-laden moments, before the Human Rights Act, I said this is going to turn into a mass of, of cases where instead of being two days, there'd be 20 days, where there'd be all this factual analysis, because human rights is much vaguer, and there'll be courts taking witness statements, it'll take ages, I was more or less wrong. It's true that when you were asking a question, has the authority breached the human rights of the person in front of me, it's more possible that you want to know more about the facts, than if you're asking a simple question along the lines of, did this public authority act irrationally? But it hasn't happened much. It has forced the courts, again, I think it's a good thing, to be more honest about the kinds of things they don't want to get stuck into. What Lord Bingham in the Belmarsh case called relative institutional competence. So you're a court 
some guys in front of you makes a plausible argument about a breach of human rights, and you have to ask yourself, is this the kind of thing I can be doing? In a talk I gave, I, I think even in a book, I called it kind of like swimming pool analogy. So the judge has to work out whether it's the shallow end where he's allowed to jump in or she, or whether it's the deep end and they're out of their depth. I wrote a, an, I, I gave a lecture called Are the Judges Out of Their Depth? And the next year, Baroness Hay of Richmond gave this, this, a lecture in the same series, and her lecture was called, what was it called? It was called Waving Not Drowning. So it was very good, wasn't it? That was putting me in my place. Hey, we're not drowning, we're waving. Very good. Today on the bedroom tax, especially. Still there, we old Brenda Hale. Uh, it's not yet the case that the common law, the common law judicial review applies proportionality, routine. It's not yet the case. Surprising, but not yet the case. Uh, this, there is a paper, is complicated and really interesting. There's a paper. Adam has the paper. I can send you the paper. You don't have to read the paper. This is what it's about. Basically, who made the original decision? If it's a public authority, well, we're going to do the proportionality analysis ourselves. We're going to look at it afresh. But what if the original decision is by a court? Oh, that's a bit different. That's a court. We like courts. They're good. So we're not going to do it as heaven. And there's a whole lot of complicated cases in front of the Supreme Court about how you review a court, whether as an original decision maker or on appeal, for compliance with the convention, to the extent that it involves a question of proportionality. Do you make a fresh proportionality analysis? Or do you ask only, did they get, that is the lower court, it right or wrong? Complicated stuff, fascinating stuff, serious law stuff, and uh, I think the judges have got the right answer, which is right or wrong, but they've, they've messed it up a bit by being uncertain, and there's been a lot of cases on it. So, generally speaking, proportionality test, where it's a public authority that's not a court, the courts make that analysis afresh. They don't subject to, subject to deference, subject to relative institutional competence. Competence. Where it's a court, they tend to take the court's word for it. Although some of the justices, like Lady Hale and Lord, what's his name from Northern Ireland, Kerr, thought they should be always making it. They should be always doing it. Every, every level. But that'd be complicated. That'd be relitigating. So they don't. And then thirdly, where does the Human Rights Act, how does it fit with judge-made law? The third of my three little common law appearance. Uh, judge-made law, what do I mean by that? I mean A versus B, where there's no statute. In other words, true blue common law, A versus B, C versus D. Answer, there weren't many gaps. There weren't many gaps. Uh, so there wasn't much of a mismatch. What I mean by that is I hit somebody and jump on them. That's a breach of convention rights, probably Article 3, but it's also assault, so there's no gap. Or uh, I hold somebody without their authority, uh, they can sue me for false imprisonment. They don't need the right to liberty. It's there, it's sorted. Uh, the old Wade scare, that was great. That was great. You know, Professor Sir H.W.R. Wade, argued that the Human Rights Act had by accident abolished the common law. Section 6, <coughs> subsection 3, sub, subsection 8. And he did this in front of the Judicial Studies Board in 1999. And it threw everything to a panic. But he was being over literal. It didn't, but it's funny. It's in the paper. I'm not going to waste time on it now. It's an old debate. Where there are gaps, the human rights thing has been very happy. And there was only one really <laughs> mega serious gap. And the really mega serious gap was encapsulated in a very sad case, Kay and Robertson, just before the Human Rights Act, eight years ago. <coughs> Locke, who's a well-known celebrity, as Chris Patton said, a celebrity is someone I've never heard of. So I can't remember what he was in, some show. <coughs> and he was very sick. 
and the newspapers crept into his hospital, got to his bed, took pictures of him. Pretty bad. And they tried to stop the pictures, and the court said, nothing, we can't do anything. We can't do anything. And the point was, there was no right to respect for privacy in English common law. And though we all know the judges can finesse it a bit, that would have been a finesse too far. Malone and the Metropolitan Police Commissioner, 1983, if 83 I think it was, they can't invent a right to privacy. Hey presto, now they can. Now they can. Because they've got Article 8 of the European Convention of Human Rights, and so when it's A versus B, I no public authority. That's the point, right, folks? That's the point. There's no public authority. You can't rely on the duty on the public authority. The only public authority in the room is the court, and the court says we will develop the common law in a way that is convention compatible. So there is now a right to privacy. It might be balanced against the rights to freedom of expression. It might be qualified as a right to information or a right to confidential information. But essentially, if you're a footballer and you're embedded with a couple of people, and, or you're a rock star, uh, you can go to court and you can say, don't publish, and you don't need to show assault, and you don't need to show distress, and you don't need to show uh, uh, nuisance. Privacy will do it. Now, parenthetically, I think you look no further for the hostility of the newspapers to the Human Rights Act than the negative commercial impact of the development of the right to privacy, which began in an hilarious case involving somebody called Douglas, who was married to some Welsh person. And his, the photographs of his wedding were revealed <coughs> against his will, showing him to be an old, rather fat man, ill shaven. In other words, not touched up and taken with a hidden and uh, smuggled in. Uh, camera uh, and, and, and uh, Douglas Sand OK magazine or something. Starting with that, the press did not expect the Human Rights Act to cover them. They thought it was all going to be about them versus the state, and they were furious. They tried to exempt themselves in debates in the House of Lords on the Human Rights Bill. They failed. They have taken a commercial hit because celebrities have money. And they only usually want to reveal stuff about the private lives of celebrities because revealing information about the private lives of people like me would be irrelevant because nobody would know who I was. So they've been a bit stuck. And I think that's one of the reasons they've been so opposed to the Human Rights Act. Big picture point from the common law, more or less, the Human Rights Act has gone with the flow of the common law. You'd expect that. The common law has been around for 700 years. The judges are all sort of common law people. Culturally, it'd be very difficult for them to throw it out. We haven't had a revolution. The second parents had a less easy relationship with Britain, as you can imagine, because it's continental Europe, or as the British call it, Europe. Britain not being in Europe, and not being in Antarctica either, so I have no idea which continent it belongs to, but it's not Europe. And here we see much more evidence of rejection. And remember, another thing you guys might take for granted, the Human Rights Act didn't have to include the European Convention on Human Rights. It was a new thing. And they chose to go with Schedule 1, the Convention Rights. They chose that for good practical reasons. It was a ready-made human rights thing. They would spend ages drafting their own human rights thing. It would almost certainly not get through. But the effect was, this was thought from the start to be a European measure. And in 1997-98, there was already the burgeoning of the disease in our culture were anti-European. It started after Maastricht in 1992, and Euroscepticism had merged with Little Englander, and there was already an incipient mistrust of stuff from Europe. And we see that increasingly with comments on the case law from, uh, from the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, initially, let's follow it. 
but more recently, as a result of this Horncastle case, you don't have to follow it. If the European Court of Human Rights is dealing with something we really know and love, criminal procedures, hearsay evidence, witness protection, we really know about it, we've been doing this since the 13th century, and these people come along and they force us to do stuff we don't like, we're not going to do it. That's a change, 2009. 14th case in the UK Supreme Court. So I think it's to do with the, with the institution of confidence of a, new, of a new headquarters. And since then, the judges have become really quite critical of the Strasbourg Court. I'm talking, of course, though most politicians don't know this, about the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg and not the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg, a rookier that I'm sure none of you would make, but that obviously many, many politicians make all the time. In this, look at this very recent case, uh, Lord Wilson, he expresses profound respect for the, division, for the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights. Now, if anybody ever, here's a tip, if anybody in Britain ever expresses profound respect for you, run out of the room. <laughs> run out of the room. Because this is what, it normally is, it's normally going to be so heavy. Uh, Lord Wilson says, the line of authorities under Article 6 has been, quote, in a Supreme Court case, swept into hopeless and probably irretrievable confusion. An analogy is to a boat which, once severed from its moorings, floats out to sea and is tossed hopelessly this way and that. That's how we describe Strasbourg cases. So that's very, very critical. And the Mark Twain quote from 2013 <coughs> is a case on damages. And Strasbourg, the European Court of Human Rights, has got quite a lot of cases on damages. And they are on the boring side. But this is what Lord Reed said when the cases were cited. To adapt Mark Twain's remark about life, the citation of authorities is liable to amount to little more than one damn thing after another. Or even, to borrow a well-known repast, the same damn thing over and over again. Imagine writing that about Strasbourg cases in the Supreme Court. They are absolutely drifting away from the European Court of Human Rights when they want to. And again, it's about reassertion of traditional approaches. By traditional, I mean common law. And they've been toying with running stuff which is obviously human rights -y, but not as human rights at all. So, so not mentioning the Human Rights Act. And good advocates nowadays will try and present things as not human rights. There are cases from well, five years ago, so they haven't really followed it up very much, where the judges interrupt and said, have you thought about restitution? Or what about the rule of Wilkinson and Danton? Never mind all this human rights stuff. So we see on this parent a little bit of teenage rebellion. Now, those are the two parents. Well, it's now 21 so it's an adult striking out on its own. And here we have some, just two or three uh, points uh, as we uh, head on the downhill slope towards completion, where there are some really interesting legal issues that are now capable of being analyzed, analyzed in an interesting way because there's enough cases, but nobody's looking at them. So again, I repeat what I said, this is not about the substance, it's about the management of the constitutional challenge of integrating the human rights law in our framework of law. And this is a particularly interesting one, and I haven't got cases to go into, but it's fascinating. Managing this, the, the tension between parliamentary sovereignty and human rights. Now, we all know, I'm assuming, you cannot strike down acts of power. But we also know that you can interpret stuff so far as possible, in a way that is compatible with convention rights. What happens when a public authority says, I had to do it. The Act of Parliament made me do it. That's okay. He or she is allowed to do it. Section 6.2a. But, and here's the nice one, 
mostly Parliament does not make public authorities to do anything. It normally says, you may if you want. You, sh you, you may if satisfied, if of opinion that. Why? Because it's complicated to dictate to public authorities. So what happens if a public authority is implementing a law, which cannot be challenged in the Human Rights Act, where the implementation involves a breach of human rights, but where they had a discretion not to act? They didn't have to do it. They could have done nothing. Or where they have five different ways of implementing the act at their discretion, and a sixth bizarre way, which would not breach human rights. Answer section 6 to B. They should not act in a way that defeats the purpose of the act itself. So if you pass a nasty act, if you pass a nasty act, the public authority, knowing it's nasty, exercises its discretion to drive the nastiness home, they're okay under section 6 to B. I'd say, I think it's an amazingly well-drafted bill. To have anticipated that problem and dealt with it in the way that it did is clever. There's cases on it, not as many as you'd expect, and it'll be litigated in the future without question. Second tricky point, fascinating, won't stay with it very long. What happens where you're trying to challenge a rule under a statute, but not everybody under the rule has their human rights infringed. How many people need to have their rights infringed under the rule for you to be able to attack the rule itself? Fascinating question. It's come up in recent cases. I've got a case in the High Court coming up where everybody affected by the rule has their human rights infringed. But that's unusual. If only two have, let them take challenges against the exercise of the discretion against them in individual rule decisions. But if, in the words of, who did I put up here? Uh, Lady Hale, this is the one they've gone for. Non-compliance is...